I hope you enjoyed the first program. Um, we had to switch actors at the last minute, just before the program started. So some of these people were acting without a rehearsal. They were going cold on this. <laughs> There's nothing in broadcasting that can scare your pants off like a good old time radio horror program. And few programs did it as well as the Inner Sanctum Mysteries, produced by Hyman Brown and aired from 1941 through 1952. Inner Sanctum Mysteries featured one of the most memorable and atmospheric openings in radio history. An organist hit a dissonant chord, a doorknob turned, and the famous creaking door slowly began to open. Brown got the idea for a door in the basement of the studio that squeaked like hell. However, on its first use, the door was silent. <laughs> Undaunted, Brown grabbed a nearby chair, sat in it and turned, causing a hair-raising squeak. From then on, he used the chair as the sound prop. However, on at least one memorable occasion, a staffer innocently repaired and oiled the chair, thus forcing the sound man to mimic the squeak orally. <laughs> now let us get ready for this program. Close your eyes and imagine that you have your whole family with you gathered around the radio in your living room. The year is 1945. The lights are dim as your family faces the big console radio with its 37 knobs, of which only two work on, off, and volume. Tonight's second program is from the Inner Sanctum Mysteries, and it has a most appropriate name for Halloween. The undead. A happily married young woman finds a 10-year-old obituary for her husband. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mystery. friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door for another half hour of lovely chills and shudders. Oh, uh, before we begin tonight, I'd like to give you a word of advice. If you should ever walk through a cemetery at midnight and come face to face with a transparent personality floating above a tombstone, don't be frightened. After all, you can see right through him. <laughs> Good gracious, why do we have to talk about cemeteries? Because Mary, our story tonight is about a vampire. Where else would you expect to find one if not in a cemetery? In the Vampire State Building? <laughs> <laughs> well, suppose you go wait in the closet there and talk to the skeleton while I have a word with our Lipton listeners about one secret of success. You know, folks, when a Hollywood actress climbs up to stardom, it's usually because there's something different about her personality. And that's true of other success stories. Lipton Tea, for example, is the largest selling brand of tea in the world because it's different from other teas. Lipton's has that wonderful hearty flavor that tea experts call brisk, which means it's bright and zestful in taste, never wishy-washy or flat. Now don't take my word for it. Compare Lipton's to other teas yourself. 
That's the real way to discover Lipton's rich, full flavor. Lipton's extra flavor that brings you all the goodness of a superb tea. It's full-bodied and satisfying with a smooth, mellow tang that brings you real enjoyment. So pour yourself a cup of Lipton tea, folks, and then see for yourself what a difference that brisk flavor makes. Well, that's fine, Mary, but quietly, my dear. But why the whisper? Shh! Don't make too much noise or you'll wake the dead. And we don't want to do that because tonight's story is called The Undead. It's an original radio play by Milton Lewis. Yes, and our star tonight is Anne Seymour, who plays the role of Diana. I was alone here in the penthouse sleeping. The doors leading to the terrace were open. Suddenly, I was awakened by a queer, whirring noise that sounded like the flapping of wings. I opened my eyes. Moonlight filled the room. It was one of those clear, cloudless nights, but the wind moaned and howled like weeping women. Somewhere, a dog howled. I sat up, peered into the green light of the moon. I saw nothing at first. I, I lay down again. My eyes were half closed. Then I heard it again, the sound of wings beating in the air. I told myself it was nothing. And out of the queer green shadows that surrounded me like a mist, I saw a pair of blood-red eyes close to my face. No, they weren't human eyes. They were rimmed with greed, and they glittered like a glass in the dark. I looked closer, too frightened to move, too terrified to cry out. The thing that seemed to be flying around my head looked like a bat. But it wasn't a bat. Suddenly, it floated down. I felt soft fur on my neck, and my throat was pierced with a sharp, terrible pain. I started screaming, let me go, let me go. Richard, where are you? Richard, Richard. Go on, Diana. When I felt your arms around me, I knew I was safe, Richard, but it was the most horrible dream I ever had. Yes, I know, I know, darling, you were hysterical. What do you think it meant? Why, nothing, nothing, of course, dear. Everyone has nightmares like that sometime or another. But it was so vivid. I could almost swear it happened just as I told it to you. Oh, now, Diana, do you really believe you encountered a vampire? I know it sounds ridiculous, darling. Listen, baby, you're living in New York City on top of an 18-story building. This is 1945, not the Middle Ages. Why, the whole notion is just rubbish. I tried to tell myself it was nonsense, too, but somehow, oh, oh Richard, I, I want to get out of this place. But why? I don't like this apartment. There's something evil and sinister here. I, I've always felt it. And listen. Listen to that wind. The wind howls around here all the time. Well, naturally. It's a penthouse, and it catches the winds from the river. Hear that? Something's flapping on the terrace. Just the awning, dear. There are always queer noises around here all the time, and I, I can't bear being up here all alone here at night. Richard, please, please don't let me stay here alone tonight. I can't stay with you, darling. I've, I've got to go to the theater. I don't want you to go there. Please, l let, let your understudy take your part tonight. Take me away from here. 
far away where it's warm and there's sunlight. Diana, you don't know what you're saying. I can't give up my part in the show. Of course. Of course. Uh, darling, forgive me, please. Uh, I'm sorry I ever mentioned it. You do forgive me, don't you, Richard? Say you do. Why, of course. You're, you're just upset over those silly dreams. I know. I know. I, I won't mention it again. You're okay. Baby. Well, it's ten to eight. I'd better get going. Want to come with me? Yes. No. No, I'm going to stay here. But if this place frightens you... I... That's just why I'm going to stay. And alone. I'm going to beat this thing. Somehow. That's better, darling. Much better. He he here's your coat, and, and you'd better take your scarf. It, it feels chilly. Richard. Hmm? I said I won't mention it again, but there's one thing more I have to tell you that... the face of, that thing in my dream, it was... your face. Diana, in the name of heaven, what are you... I won't talk of it anymore, I promise you, darling. I, I didn't mean to upset you before you went to the theater. J just kiss me, dear. I'll, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Oh, Diana. Good night, dear. I'll be waiting when you get back. It was just midnight, two nights later. I was waiting for Richard to come home from the theater. I was going through his desk looking for a postage stamp and I found something that turned my blood to ice. It was a newspaper clipping dated 10 years ago, a picture of a man. And under it, the caption, prominent real estate operator, Richard Barker, found dead of a sudden stroke. I looked at the picture again There could be no doubt about it. It was Richard. I read further. The deceased will be buried at Green Lawn Cemetery after services at the Westwood Funeral Chapel. Good evening, Diana. R Richard! What, what's the matter? You seem startled. I, I, I didn't hear you come in. Have you been brooding again? No, Richard, of course not. Well, how do you feel tonight? Not... Not very well. Weak? Weak, sleepy, ill. Well, no wonder you've hardly been eating a thing. I know that you never catch a wink of sleep. I told you I can't sleep in the daytime as you do. As you do. Why are you staring at me like that? Why? Why do you sleep in the daytime? I've been doing it for years. Years? What's so terrible about that? Most theatrical people do. We live and work at night. Yes, yes, I, I know. Really, Diana, what is the matter with you? Nothing. You... you think I'm losing my mind? Well, I don't know what to think. Why are you pretending? Pretending what? That you're something other than what you are. Because I know what you are, Richard. Really? This clipping I found in your desk, it, it tells how you died. That clipping, oh, <laughs> oh, that. Why are you laughing? Well, you see, it's a joke, a gag. One of my pictures was sent to the papers as publicity for a new play, you know, and a drunken typesetter put it in the obituary column. It's quite an amusing story. I, I don't believe you. You're lying. Listen, you can't go on like this. No, don't, don't touch me. You're not well, darling. Get away from me. I, I just want to kiss you. No, don't, don't, don't touch me. Diana, where are you going? Out of here. Diana, come back! I'll come back when I've proved something to myself! Is there anyone there? What do you want, ma'am? I'm sorry to wake you up, but, but are you caretaker here at Green Lawn? Many years. I, uh, 
I want to see the grave of Richard Barker. Who are you? Diana Barker, his wife. But it's one in the morning, Mrs. Barker. I know what time it is. I, I want to see the grave. No one comes at a time like this. Please, will you tell me? Perhaps this will help. Ten dollars? For disturbing you. All right. You take the path in the back of my house, turn to the right. You have a flashlight? I brought one from the car. It's only a short way, but it isn't a grave, ma'am. It's sort of uh, a tomb. Thank you. I'll find it. You, uh, you want me to come with you? No, I've uh, troubled you enough. Good night. Good night. Somewhere an owl was howling, as though warning me not to go on with this insane adventure. But I knew I had to continue. I had to be certain. I followed his directions along the path of the cemetery. Moon poked yellow fingers through scudding clouds as though showing me the way. I was frightened, terrified. I had nothing to fear from the dead. I kept telling myself I had to keep up my courage. The dead! Perhaps they were right. There was nothing to fear from then. But the undead. It was a tomb. The inscription was clear. Here lies Richard Barker, born May 7th, 1890, died September 4th, 1935. There was a lock on the door. It was old and rusty. I'd come this far, I made up my mind. I, I picked up a stone. I smashed the lock. I opened the door. Blackness, inky blackness such as one imagines one would see at the end of the world. I turned on the flashlight I took from the car. The coffin was lying in the center of the tomb on an altar. I felt my heart beating wildly, like a throbbing drum inside me. With a trembling hand, I opened the coffin. I looked down on a ghastly white satin lining. That was all there was in the coffin. There was nothing else. It was empty. I looked up. There was a face staring at me from the shadows of the tomb. It was Richard. <laughs> well, friends, that just goes to show that an empty coffin makes the most noise. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of nice domestic story I like. The intimate family chronicle of a vampire. My goodness, is that what you call intimate family life? Why, of course, Mary. It looks like our lovebirds would even share the same coffin. <laughs> I'm afraid you're drawing a very strange picture of family life, Mr. Host. Now, I always picture the family gathered around the dinner table. Everyone's laughing and happy. The bright lights push back the shadows of evening outside and shine on the teacups, where Lipton tea is waiting to add to the family's mealtime pleasure. Lipton's brisk flavor will make that good meal taste even better. Everyone around the table, from junior to grandfather, will enjoy its tempting fragrance, its deep amber color, and that brisk flavor that makes Lipton's different from other teas. They all like its full-bodied, hearty goodness and the zestful tang of Lipton's flavor. So serve Lipton tea for dinner at your house, folks, and round out the family picture with real enjoyment. Right, Mary. 
And now let's go back to our horrors. Let me see. What dire predicament are we in tonight? Oh, yes. Diana has just discovered that her husband was wandering around his tomb. What would you do in a situation like that? Here's what Diana did. Listen. I ran blindly, stumbling, tearing my clothes. Somehow I managed to reach the car, start the motor. In the car, I knew it wasn't all some dream. People didn't come back from the dead. Did they? Could they? I drove toward the city. I wanted to see the lights, people, hear music. I wanted to be sure this was the world I had always known. I tried to think. I, I tried to reason. I tried to understand what had happened to me because I knew something, something was happening to me, something that I dreaded. I was becoming like, like them, like Richard. I felt a strange craving, desires that I didn't dare think of. Excuse me, Mrs. Barker. Oh. May I sit with you? I, I don't believe I know you. Perhaps not. Does it make any difference? Well, no, it, it doesn't. Please sit down. Thank you. I'm glad you came over. I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk to anyone tonight. I've been watching you for the last 10 minutes. Have you? Yeah, you. You look very strange tonight. How do you know me? We all know each other. We? Yes. You realize you'll be dead soon. Dead? At least. What they call dead. You... you know what happened? Oh, yes, of course. I've seen it happening for weeks. Your face became paler and paler. It will not be long now. You'll become one of us. I don't want to. It's not in your hands. It, it isn't true. It can't be true. Oh, quite true. Many of us have gone on for hundreds of years. Those who submit become like us. I'm, I'm not. I won't. There is no escape. No, I don't believe it. Don't you feel it? That strange desire? Yes. <laughs> there, you see? I don't want to. I once tried to fight it, too. It's no use. I'm going away. Far away where you can't reach me. I'm going away anywhere where I can... Waiter, waiter. Will you help me here? There's been an accident. Everything's going to be all right, Diana. Just lie here and, and rest quietly. You're in your own home. I opened my eyes and saw Claudia, my older sister. Never was I so glad to see anyone in all my life. Claudia had always helped me, always advised me. She'd know what to do. You want something to eat? No, I, I'm not hungry. But the doctor says you have to eat. How did I get here? You collapsed in the cocktail lounge. They brought you home. When? Last night. But it's dark out. You've been sleeping for almost 24 hours. Where's Richard? At the theater. Oh, poor boy. He's been so worried about you. What's he? Well, he sent for me. I've been with you since last night. Diana, what happened? It it's terribly difficult to explain. I sometimes think I'm losing my mind. I, I'd be sure that's what it is if, it, if I hadn't found out differently. Well, tell me about it. I... I found out Richard is... dead. 
He's been dead for 10 years. What? What are you talking about? It's true, Claudia. I went to Green Lawn. I saw his tomb. I opened it and the coffin was empty. Diana, you've got to... I know what you're thinking, but I'm not insane. He never sleeps at night. And now I feel this strange craving. Oh, Claudia, I'm so scared. Do you know what you're saying? Yes, I know it sounds wild. Fantastic. But I haven't told this to anyone. But it's true. There are things in this world you only think are primitive superstitions, but... Claudia, you must believe me. Well, yes, yes, of course. I believe you, dear. We, we must destroy Richard. I read about those things. We must destroy him by driving a wooden stake through his heart. That's the only way I can escape from him. That's the only way I can become a human being again. Diana, you, you just... You'll help me, Claudia? Oh, of course, dear. Haven't I always helped you? Where, where are you going? Oh, just, just to fix you something to eat? No. You're going to leave me. Leave me here alone with him. I I won't let you. I won't let you do that, Claudia. That, that gun. Where did you get that gun? We've always had one here. Ever since I first told Richard I was afraid of this place. You're not going to leave me alone now, Claudia. I'm not going to let you. Oh, of course not. Get away from that door. Well, if that's what you want, yeah, Claudia, you that's... come back. No, you hear me? No! She's gone. She was so sure I was insane. She didn't even give me a chance to explain. I was alone in the house. I felt terribly weak. I wanted to sleep. Oh, I wanted to sleep forever and ever. I knew if I lay down and closed my eyes, I might never open them again. Never open them and see the world as you or I used to. I, I'd be something else. I looked at the clock, almost midnight. Richard would be coming back any minute. I ran to the door, locked it from the inside with a safety bolt. What to do, what to do? Police, I ran to the phone. Operator. Hello, operator. Get me the police and hurry, please. One moment, please. Hurry, will you? This is a matter of life and death. Hello, are you ringing them? Police department, Sergeant Kilwe talking. Hello, police, you've got to help me. Yes, what is it, lady? My husband, he's going to do something to me tonight. He's going to make me what he is. Uh, what's that, lady? He's been dead for 10 years. I saw his empty coffin. That's proof, isn't it? That's evidence. You always want evidence, and there it is. Now do you understand? Well, uh, I'm not sure I do, lady. Uh, what's your name? Diana Barker. Well, all right, all right, let, all right now. Calm down. Tell me where you live. I live... Oh, you think I'm insane too, don't you? Uh, I didn't say that. You think I'm crazy, just as Claudia does. If you just give me your address, lady, I'll... Oh, come. what's the use? Please, lady, I... No one believes me. I know I'm not insane. I know it. And yet... What's that? His key. In the lock. He can't open it. It's bolted from the inside. He's trying to get in. Well, he can't. Not with that bolt. I won't open it. I won't. I'll just pretend I don't hear it. I'll cover my ears with my hands and I won't hear it. He can't get in here. If I can keep him out till daylight, I'll be safe. The doorbell stopped. near me, but he couldn't get in. No, he couldn't get into the penthouse. There's no way to get in unless he came through the terrace. And there's no way to get on the terrace unless he could fly. <gasps> fly? The wind was screaming. When I turned to lock the French doors into the terrace, it was impossible. He couldn't. And yet, he couldn't. And yet, the doors burst open. The wind blew through the house like a cyclone. There he was, framed in the double doors. Why didn't you let me in? How... how did you get on the terrace? Never mind. What are you doing with that gun? 
Don't come near me, Richard. Diana. Go away. Go away and leave me alone. Give me that gun. No. I'm warning you, Diana. You'd better give it to me. If you take another step toward me, I'll fight. Diana. You see? The bullets. They didn't harm you. No. I didn't miss. No. Empty. You see? It didn't it do didn't any... didn't do any good. Where are you... Where are you going to... What are you going to do? I'm going to put an end to this once and for all, Diana. An end? I prepared for this. I have a knife, you see? You can't! Don't be afraid, Diana. You won't quite die yet. No, no, Richard! I'm here, Diana. No, you're making no. too much trouble while you're alive. Oh, no! Help me, somebody! Stop him! Stop! I saw the knife over my throat. I beat at his chest with the empty pistol. Then just before everything went black, I saw three flashes of lightning. Go on, Mrs. Barker. When I woke up in the hospital, Inspector, I couldn't believe that I was still alive. It, it seemed like a miracle. You would have been dead if it weren't for your sister. Claudia? She came back with one of our men. He shot and killed your husband just as he was about to plunge the dagger into you. But how did he get in? Oh, he came over the adjoining terrace from the penthouse next door, just as your husband did. No, Mrs. Barker, your husband didn't fly. But the other things, the picture, the tomb, the empty coffin. All those were props for an elaborate scheme your husband worked out to murder you. Richard Barker is not an uncommon name. He found a man with that name who died 10 years ago. He removed the body, got the whole idea from the dream you told him about. But why? But to establish that you were insane. Oh. He planned to murder you and claimed he did it in self-defense to protect himself against an insane woman. But the gun. <laughs> Filled with blanks. He wanted to get your money, Mrs. Barker. But the, the way I felt, those strange cravings. Oh, you suffered from anemia. The doctor told us that. It's not uncommon for anemia sufferers to feel the way you did. I still can't believe it. I, I still feel that he isn't quite dead. I'll relieve your fears right now. His body is in the next room. I think you should see it. Come this way, Miss Barker. There, raise the lid of the coffin, Charlie. Yes, Inspector. <gasps> What's the matter? He looks so lifelike. His lips are so red. He looks as though he can move. Get up at any minute. Nonsense. I tell you, he's quite dead, Mrs. Barker, and I can further assure you that the police department has never encountered one authentic vampire in its history. You're, you're very reassuring, Inspector. I think I'd better leave now. Don't bother to see me to the door. Goodbye. All right, Charlie. Cover him up and have him buried. Okay, Inspector. Oh! Uh, what is it, Charlie? Inspector, uh, maybe I'm nuts, but I could have sworn I saw him move. Ah, uh, nonsense. Close the lid. Uh, it's getting late, dark, Charlie. Sun sure goes down quickly these winter days, and I am going home. Good night, Charlie. Do you think Richard is really dead? That's something for you to sleep on when you go to bed tonight. 
Oh, and by the way, we have a moral for tonight's story. Yes, it's taken from the diary of Miss Delirium Tremens, who once said, Never marry a vampire. He may turn out to be 500 years old without a social security number to his name. How could a girl have any fun going around with a guy like that? Well, Mr. Host, I don't think that's a serious problem. I'm positive that no girl will ever meet a vampire, much less marry one. Ah, but you can't be sure, Mary. The safest thing is to drive a wooden stake through your husband's heart. Yes, if he dies, then he must be a vampire. <laughs> oh, such foolishness. Let's forget all this talk about vampires because I want to tell the folks about something wonderful that's going to happen next month. Next month is November, you know, so instead of our usual mystery thriller, we will give up our radio time to the Riverside Township Radio Players, a loud and rowdy ensemble from delightful Riverside Township in Illinois. They promise to continue our celebration with holiday programming that will be a grand evening of fun for the whole family. So be sure to tune into this station at the regular Inner Sanctum time next month. I promise you the show brought to you by the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup will be the crowning event in November. Well, that sounds great, Mary. You know, November is really a wonderful month. There's something about Thanksgiving that gets to even the most hardened characters. <laughs> There'll be no gore, no chills, not even one little murder, believe it or not. The holiday spirit is even getting to us. So be sure to join us next month. Meanwhile, I'm going to do my Thanksgiving shopping. You know where I can get a nice pot of blood soup? And a mincemeat pie for my ghoulish friends? <laughs> Until next month. Then good night, pleasant dreams. Hmm? <laughs> Folks, these busy days, we all want to save time when we prepare meals, and yet we don't want to sacrifice that good homemade taste. Well, that's just the time to serve Lipton's noodle soup. Lipton's has a real fresh cooked chickeny flavor. It tastes like the chicken noodle soup you'd make right in your own kitchen, and yet it takes almost no time at all to prepare. And Lipton's is economical too. It costs less, makes lots more than canned soups, so don't forget to try Lipton's noodle soup mix, and remember to tune in next month for the Riverside Township Radio Players special Thanksgiving show. <laughs> now let me introduce the cast of The Undead. Our beleaguered heroine, Diana Barker, was played by our own panic-stricken star, Susan Gadzinski. Her affectionate yet apprehensive sister, Claudia, was played by Donna Amesmeyer. Richard Barker, her malevolently treacherous husband, was played by Dave Sanchi. The cantankerous cemetery caretaker was played by Marty McNulty.
Our mysterious androgynous vampire was Nellie Brennan. The incredulous Irish sergeant was played by Walt Kovalik. The level-headed rational inspector, and how did he get in this show? I don't know. Was played by Roger Morris. The cool, calm, and collected operator was played with poise by Sue Kovalik. The officer on the scene, Charlie, was played by John V. Gelsimino. The cheerful Lipton Tea Lady was delicately and tastefully played to perfection by our Ellie Babka. The multifaceted special effects man who must juggle lines and sounds is Marty McNulty. Uh, we must note that we have an incomparable technical crew doing sound and video for our programs, John V. Gelsimino and Lorenza Cordoba. Now, I have to tell you, I didn't write this stuff here, so don't blame me. Um, in addition, your weird and wonderfully demented host for the evening was Jay Summerfield. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce November's director, Sue Gazinski. Next month, the third Friday of the month, not the last Friday, November 18th, is our next performance. We'll be doing a warm, lovely story, Home for Thanksgiving, starring Jane Wyman, and a Gildersleeve, starring the great Gildersleeve, Thanksgiving. Remember, it's the third Friday of the month before Thanksgiving, right here. See you next month. Thanks, Sue. Taking on the responsibility for directing a program compels you to see more of the behind the scene activities that precede a successful show. One learns that there's a lot more preparation necessary long before a show is ready for the stage. Part of the preparation includes designing and printing the seemingly simple posters, which once prepared, have to be placed all over the area. The members of Riverside Township Radio Players volunteer their time and energy finding locations that consent to having the posters displayed on their property. Our TRP members, please stand and take a bow. Uh, please consider doing business wherever you see the posters. Donna, come here. I think it is also important that we note the huge effort it takes to get publicity for the shows. Every month, our publicist quietly creates articles and gets the information out to the various news agencies. Please give special thanks to our own Donna Amesmeyer. We also want to remind everyone to join us in thanking Riverside Township and its board, currently under the supervision of Richard Tusher, for continuing to promote and support these programs for 15 seasons. In addition, these shows are televised for local cable network six, as well as appearing on the internet at www.riversideradio.net for the current year shows and at www.riversideradioold.net for previous years. Thank you for coming and please bring your family and friends when we meet again next month on Friday, November 18th at 7.30 p.m. 
be safe this Halloween. And good evening. <laughs> And as further proof that the township really is behind us, we have two of their trustees right in the front row here. Thank you, thank you very much, Kibitskis, for coming. <laughs>